Welcome back to my channel. I hope you all are doing well. Today is your regularly scheduled true crime and makeup video. I know this is your second this month, but this was the original one you guys were going to have this month. Today's case is quite brutal and sick, unbelievable, and heartbreaking. The victim today, her name is Jessica Chambers. But we're not only going to be talking about her, we also will be talking about a possible injustice of attempting to prosecute the wrong guy. So let's jump straight into it. But first, you know the drill. Like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications of when I upload, and like I said, let's jump straight into it. As always, let me get ready. So, Jessica Lane Chambers was born February 2nd, 1995 in Clarksdale, Mississippi. But her and her family lived in a small town called Cortland, which was an hour south of Memphis, Tennessee. A small background of Cortland is that it has a lot of farmland and churches. Also, Mississippi they don't mess around when it comes to their faith or football. It only has a population of 500 people, which is very small. I mean, that was the size of my graduating class. Jessica's sister AJ says that it was a type of small town that everyone knew each other or was friendly with each other. So if they saw somebody on the street that didn't know each other, that they would still say hi to one another. All the neighborhood kids would be in one yard playing some kind of ball, whether it was kickball, football. So Jessica had five siblings and her parents' names were Ben and Lisa. And they separated a few years after Jessica was born in 1998. And Ben didn't live too far from Lisa. He actually lived on the same street down the road. He remarried to a woman named Debbie and they have a cute little girl named Annabelle who looks quite like Jessica actually and Jessica is the only child of Lisa and Ben so Jessica's other siblings are half siblings but that don't stop them from being very close with one another. Jessica went to high school at South Panola High. Panola is the name of the county that Cortland is a part of. And there at that high school, Jessica was a cheerleader. She's actually been a cheerleader since she was in sixth grade. She was 12 years old. But before that, she was really into softball. She was really good at both being a softball player and a cheerleader. But when she was a cheerleader, she absolutely loved it. And she was great at it. She was tiny and small in stature. So she was what's called a flyer. And that's when they throw you up in the air. So because she was so small and tiny, it made her perfect to be thrown up in the air. Jessica was said to be very talented when she put her mind towards anything she wanted to do. She was known for always smiling, being full of life, very beautiful, and very stubborn. Her friends and those who met her said that she was always that she was always joyful and a funny person to be around. And they have said that she has never seen color. Her favorite color was pink. She wanted to be an author, a teacher, and mainly an RN, which I see you, girl. Me too. While in high school, she would fall into the wrong crowd and started to do weed, selling weed, and she began to have quite viatal relationships. She was never in a gang, but she was a gang member's girlfriend. 
It was around 15 and 16 when her brother Alan died. He was in a traffic accident, which happened just up the road from where Jessica would end up having her accident. So this really affected her because her and Alan were very close. And her mom, Lisa, could only take so much of what was going on with Jessica. So when Jessica was 19 in the summer of 2014, she sent her to what's known as Leah's house. And this is like a Christian rehab for people who've lost their way to find it again. And this actually worked for her. And she ended up calling her father and telling him, him that she was going to change and Jessica she actually did she got clean and she found a job and things were going great actually she was only there for a month but a week after Jessica came out of Leah's house she went up to her, her mom and said that she was afraid for her life and she stated that all these bitches think I'm snitching and she said that because some people think she was a snitch because her dad worked as a mechanic for the sheriff's station. Also, there was a rumor after what happened in this case that some people started to think that she may have been an informant. And that's why what happened in this case happened. And I will tell you right now, the police deny that, that she was not an informant at all. So let's talk about that fateful day, right? So it was December 6th, and this was not long after she went up to her mom and said she was afraid. So at 9 o'clock, Jessica wakes up and gets ready for the day and immediately heads out. And around 10 o'clock, she is seen at a convenience store called M&M, and it's the only convenience store in Cortland. After that, she is seen pulling into the driveway of a man named Quentin Tellis. Quentin is a very important person in this case, so let me pause for a second and tell you a little bit about Quentin. So, Quentin was born October 6, 1988 in Cortland. He was known by police due to the fact that he has quite a record. And he actually only just got out of prison two months before what happens to Jessica in this case. And they only just started hanging out two weeks prior. He also claims they only had sex once. And it's worth it to say that he was in a gang. And I think that's enough. Uh, yeah. So let's continue with the timeline. So she goes and picks up Quentin. And then they drive over to Jessica's other friend, Lakeisha Myers' house. And all three of them go driving around the town for about an hour. And then she drops Keisha off first. And then Quentin. When she gets home... At about 11 o'clock, she gets a message from Quentin. And pretty much it says that I, I need you. And she responds, you know, like, what do you need? And he says back some loving. And she says, oh, Lord, can't. At 1230, Jessica grabs her pajama pants and then goes and lies in the chair in the living room and takes a nap according to her mom, who is the witness of that happening. At 4.30, her mom and phone records show that she gets a phone call, and she tells her mom that she'll be back to clean her room, and that she's just going to go get food. With phone records, we are able to confirm that it was Quentin Tellis who woke her up. At 5.30, Jessica Chambers is caught on that m and cam again, and this will be the last time that any surveillance will ever catch Jessica alive. Then at 6.45, Lisa gets a call from Jessica, and Jessica says that she'll be home in a little while. 
mom bye i love you lisa says back i love you too little does she know that will be the last time she ever speaks to her daughter at 809 a call is sent to 911 about a car being on fire on heron road and there was a person standing there badly burned on the side of the road and at 8 12 the firefighters arrived now the firefighters said when they got there they didn't see jessica also, the car was placed on top of this mound away from the road by some trees and next to a fence. The vehicle was so hot that there was no evidence left. In fact, there really wasn't a car left. All there was was metal. And Jessica came out of the woods. They said she looked like a zombie. She was unrecognizable and barely alive. And all that was on her was a pair of underwear because of how badly she was burned. She was burned on 93% of her body and it was all mainly third degree burns. So let's talk about how they came up with the number 93%. I will have a picture up now to help hopefully with understanding how I explain and like kind of, I don't know, cause it, it can be kind of complicated. So pretty much they use what's called the rule of nines. Now I don't know how they came up with this, but that's what the medical staff uses. And what it does is gives an idea of how much of the total body surface area the burns take up. And this information will help decide the treatment based on the size and intensity of the burn injury. Now, the front and the back of the head equals 9% of the body surface area. The front and the back of each arm and hand equals 9%. The chest and the stomach each equals 9%. The upper back and lower back each equals 9% the front and the back of the leg and foot equals 18 percent the genital area equals one percent so 93 percent okay how they came up with that number is because she was not burned on her groin her butt the back of her upper thighs and the bottom of her feet. That equals 7%. I hope that made sense. As for the burns, there are multiple degrees, but we're focusing on just three of them as those are what people will hear most normally and what they typically know. So there's first degree, second degree, and third degree. So first degree is pretty much the outer most layer. Think of a sunburn. It'll be red and painful, no blisters. So now second degree affects the outermost layer in the dermis, which is the one underneath, and it will be red, swollen, and this one will have blisters. Now third degree destroys two full layers of skin. Instead of turning red, it will appear maybe black or brown, white or yellow. It won't hurt because the type of burn damages the nerve endings. So. I hope that kind of helps understand where she's at in this part of the case. So she got burned, she has third degree burns, and she was burned 93% of her body. Now, when the firefighters saw her, they said her skin was like leather. She couldn't make facial expressions and her tongue was swollen and how tight her skin was on her body she could barely move her lips or her mouth and they also noted that there was burns and charring inside her mouth also there was a lot of soot and she had severe difficulty speaking so when she came out of the woods some firefighters said that she was saying help me help me somebody asked her who she was and she said Jessica Tambers. Then firefighter Randy Davis asked Jessica who did this and she said Eric and he on different occasions have said that she said full out Eric did this to me so take those two I mean the way you want to. Also over the next few minutes there was multiple firefighters and personnel saying that they heard Jessica say Eric as well 
to them. Then a firefighter was sitting with her telling her, you know, sweetheart, you're going to be all right. And he said, she said back to him that she was going to die. At 8.30, sheriff's office called Ben, Jessica's father, told him that there was an accident and that Jessica got burned. And he couldn't understand this. I mean, what parent could? And plus, he lost his son a year earlier. I mean, could you, could you understand that? I mean, and then Debbie, his wife, got in the car and, and went straight over to Lisa's house, Jessica's mother. As soon as she got out of the car, she started yelling. They set her on fire. So Jessica was airlifted to a Memphis hospital and the doctors there told the family that there really wasn't anything that they could do for her. They pretty much said that the third degree burns were so severe that there was no way her body could recover from that. Because again, remember, that's 93% of your body. They also found out that, and this will be a little bit later, but they found out that somebody sprayed a accelerant down her throat. So she had burns all down her throat and in her mouth, soot. And all that is going to affect your lungs too, you know? So, I mean, now what, I know some people don't know what a accelerant might be, so what is that? I'll tell you, gladly. Accelerant is what is used to aid the spread of fire. For example, gasoline, kerosene, turpentine, and other flammable, usually petroleum-based solvents, aka ignitable liquids. So they kept Jessica on what's called comfort care, so the hospital keeps her as comfortable as possible before passing. Lisa told Jessica while holding her hand that that it's okay, you can go. And she did. And at 2.36 a.m. on December 7th, 2014, at 19 years old, just four to five hours from when she was set on fire, she passed away. And everyone said that she had an agonizing death. So two days after her murder, a special task force was put up with the FBI, DA, and the ATF. That night, they had 30 to 40 suspects. And eventually, 150 people were interviewed. And that includes 30 to 40 Eric's and Derek's in Panola County and the surrounding areas and there was no credible leads. Then on December 12th, they placed a reward for any leads that could lead to who did this to Jessica. And they started out with $11,000. The next day on December 13th, the family held a funeral for Jessica and hundreds of people attended, which is deserving, you know. But let's backtrack a few days on December 10th. The police wanted to understand what all Jessica did that day on the day of the incident. So they brought in Quentin, to talk to him. If you remember, he was with Jessica that morning. So he talked to the police willingly and he told them his story and how he was with her that morning and then told him, you know, what he did that night, which witnesses agreed, and that was that. Then three weeks later, they interviewed Quentin again to make sure things were right, and they confirmed his story. And this is kind of where he gives his alibi, which was confirmed. He also volunteered for a polygraph, which, I mean, we all know polygraphs are admissible in court, but still, he passed, and he gave DNA, fully cooperated, and one of these times, he told the police about how he and Jessica had sex once and told him where they had sex and how so um, they did it on the dirt road next to his house. And it was in the passenger seat with it reclined. And then he brought up how he had a gas can and that was in the shed. Everything checked out and they let go Quentin and forgot about him. So then the case went cold for a while and it was 2015 when people, you know, really started getting into true crime, the mystery of it, and then they found Jessica's case and they started to really interrogate this small town. They wanted alibis from people. And you know who they targeted first? Jessica's family. They wanted alibis from the father, Ben Chambers. And you know why? Even though he worked in the sheriff's office as a mechanic, he had a criminal record. What for? He was into drugs and dealing. He was convicted for it. 
but that was in 2004. That don't mean he would kill his daughter. But on online, they wanted his alibi. The community also thinks he's racist because Jessica dated black men and he didn't approve of mixed couples and he's actually stated that his kind of quote was like something outrageous that he doesn't mind mixed couples coming into his home and stuff he has a lot of black and mexican friends but when it comes to his daughter dating black men and mixed couples in general he just don't approve of it and that's how he was raised you said that on television people like why would you even say that that's that's messed up first of all i mean why oh my god people should be free to date who they want to date regardless of color okay drives me nuts people were also calling jessica a drug user a gang member a victim of domestic violence and abuse and made her run in love with the law even bigger than it was but by the way jessica wasn't a gang member she was a gang member's girlfriend if you remember and as for the drug thing she did weed and sold weed they also claim that white people shouldn't date black people and that jessica probably never dated a white boy again it shouldn't matter color it really should matter what's inside them and who makes them a person that you know that's what i think anyway i just don't understand that way of thinking in all honesty but i guess that's me all i'm gonna say is you guys really need to watch what you read on facebook on social media period not everything is true so we're gonna stop here for part one immediately after this part two will be posted so but here we are going to part with part one hope you guys are curious and really intrigued by this case so far this is insane thank you guys so much for watching i'll see you in part two hope you guys are staying safe and well bye